Thank you for joining us today for Break the Cycle, an Intimate Partner Violence Conversation, hosted by the American Academy of Ophthalmology, American Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons, and the American College of Surgeons, and the Society of Gynecologic Surgeons. I have the pleasure to introduce Dr. Barbara Bass as our moderator today. Dr. Bass leads the academic, clinical, and research mission and provides strategic direction on all aspects of George Washington's medical enterprise, including the university's relationships with the GW MFA and the GW Hospital, building a unified, high-performing academic and medical enterprise to serve the missions of education, research, clinical care, and community service. She is known for her contribution in surgical education, innovation, and policy. As chair of the Department of Surgery of the Houston Methodist Hospital, she was the founding executive director of the Houston Methodist Institute for Technology, Innovation, and Education, a U.S. first concept simulation-based education and research facility purpose built to retool practicing surgeons and healthcare providers in evolving procedural technology. As one of the first cohort of women to be promoted to professor of surgery in the U.S., serve as a general surgery residency program director to lead a funded research laboratory and to chair an academic department of surgery. She has been a visible role model and passionate advocate and sponsor for equity for all who have historically had limited access to exceptional careers in surgery and medicine. A clinically busy academic surgeon for 40 years, Dr. Bass contributed to the training of hundreds of surgery residents and medical students. She holds many firsts, seconds, and thirds as a woman to hold national leadership roles, including service as president of the American College of Surgeons, the Society for Surgery in the Elementary Track, and the Society of Surgical Chairs, chair of the American Board of Surgery and as treasurer of the American Surgical Association and the Association for Academic Surgery. Dr. Bass has been recognized for advocacy by numerous organizations, including the Nina Starr Brunwald Award and the Olga Jonasson Award from the Association of Women Surgeons, an honorary fellowship from the Society of Black Academic Surgeons, and the 2022 Distinguished Alumni of the University of Virginia. She has served on the editorial boards or as associate editor for the leading surgical journals and served on NIH study section review and advisory board. With funding from the National Science Foundation, the European Union, and industry, Bass's complementary research portfolio over the last 15 years has focused on application of computational surgery, including tissue modeling and breast serving therapy for breast cancer, surgical skill acquisition, and augmented telehealth and procedural technology. Dr. Bass earned her BS summa cum laude from Tufts University, her MD from the University of Virginia, where she was elected to the Alpha Omega Alpha Academic Honor Society. She trained in general surgery at George Washington University and completed a research fellowship at the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research, serving as a captain in the U.S. Army Medical Corps. She held appointments as professor of surgery at Weill Cornell Medicine and the University of Maryland School of Medicine. She holds honorary fellowship from the Royal College of Surgeons of England, the Royal College of Surgeons of Ireland, the College of Surgeons of Southern, East, and Central Africa. Thank you, Dr. Bass, for joining us and moderating our discussion today. We are here to talk about really an important problem, an important condition that is plaguing our profession and is plaguing our nation and the world, and that is intimate partner violence. And it's most appropriate that we focus focus on that this this month, which is just actually should have been last month, Intimate Partner Violence Awareness Month. But I hope today that those of you who are joining us will learn a lot about this condition, which I have learned much about due to the suffering of those around me over, over the last few years. Uh, we have uh, three distinguished speakers to join us today who will serve as panelists. And this will be a moderated Q&A session. And we encourage you as well to add your questions to the queue. Uh, we are, we're actually being very careful about anonymity during this conference because we know that one of the features of being involved in being a victim in, in about partner violence is in fact that fear of discovery. We, we want you to know that this is an anonymous uh, conversation. Uh, today, we have three notable authorities who have really contributed to the literature and both in their, their role as surgeon scientists, health services domain, as well as in frontline delivery care to individuals who have been the victims and perhaps also the perpetrators of intimate partner violence uh, over the course of their careers. We have three individuals joining us. Uh, the first is uh, Dr. Whitney Ross, who's an assistant professor of obstetrics and gynecology at Washington University in St. Louis. 
Uh, she's a minimally invasive gynecologic, gynecologic surgeon. She completed her MD degree at Tennessee State University and then took her training in OBGYN at Wash U, a minimally invasive gynecologic fellowship at Penn State Health. Her clinical focus is on pelvic disorders and endometriosis and chronic pelvic pain. Uh, and her uh, research focuses on multimodal interventions for endometriosis, quality of life, and uh, minimally invasive gas gynecologic surgery and care preferences of survivors of sexual trauma. Also joining us is Dr. Aaron Shriver, who is clinical professor in the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences and the Jim O'Brien Gross and Anita Gross Chair of Ophthalmology at the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine. She's uh, been a very active advocate in her state legislature, including uh, advocacy efforts at the state, national, international levels through the American Society of Ophthalmologic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery, the American Academy of, of Ophthalmology, and Women in Ophthalmology. Currently president of the Iowa Academy of Ophthalmology and is the secretary for the American Society of Ophthalmic, Plastic, and Reconstructive Surgery. Her research interests include many innovations in oculoplastic techniques, novel metrics for eyelid positioning and periocular aesthetic, surgical simulation-based training, as well as being a leading voice in defining the injury patterns associated with intimate partner violence. She completed her residency at the University of Iowa following a residency in ophthalmic, plastic, and reconstructive of surgery at the University of Miami, Bascom Palmer Eye Institute, and she was on the faculty at University of Miami uh, before moving to her current position at uh, University of Iowa. Last, our last speaker is Professor uh, Mallory Williams. He's the chief of the Division of Trauma and Critical Care at Howard University College of Medicine here in Washington, D.C. He's a Commonwealth Fund Fellow in Minority Health policy and Harvard University's Presidential Scholar. His academic interests are at the intersection of trauma and trauma care and public health. He serves as the director of the Howard University Center of Excellence for Trauma and Violence Prevention and the Hospital-Based Violence Intervention Program. He's the past chair of the surgical section of the National Medical Association and past president of the Rocky Mountain Traumatology Society. He serves as the co-chair of the Gun Violence Task Force of the National Medical Association, and he's on the executive board of directors of the William Montague Cobb National Medical Association Health Institute. He also served as a colonel in the U.S. Army Reserves and has served in both Iraq and Afghanistan theaters in the global war on terror. As a cum laude graduate of Morehouse College, he received his MD degree at the University of Maryland, where I came to know him as a medical student. He completed his general surgery residency at Wayne State University and Detroit Medical Center and critical care at Brigham and Women's Hospital. So thank you all for sharing your, I know, overburdened time to have this discussion with us on what is really a, a very, really important and often shunned and undiscussed topic in our professional community. I'm going to say that I was one of those people who uh, was unaware of the burden of intimate partner violence on the impact across all aspects of the socio-demographics that we all live in. I thought this was a disease of people unlike us. In other words, not uh, professionals, not those women of wealth, not those women of power or individuals that have those characteristics. This, this was a condition that affected the oppressed and the disadvantaged by an unfortunate loss of a dear colleague, an accomplished talented transplant surgeon, surgical educator, and residency director who was one of my faculty while I was a chair of a department of surgery. I learned a whole lot about how wrong I was about this condition and how it is a, a condition that can affect even the most accomplished among us. This is a big problem and we think, we believe that up to 30% of women will at some point in their lives experience some form of intimate partner violence, which bans the, the spectrum of coercive and controlling behavior to malignment, to physical abuse and regrettably death, as in the case of Dr. Sherilyn Gordon. That, that experience led to the formation of the college of has been come to know as the Intimate Partner Violence Task Force. The co-founders of that were myself, along with Dr. Patricia Turner, because she was a classmate, uh, a resident classmate with uh, Dr. Sherilyn Gordon at Howard University, who was lost to this condition. With that formation of the task force, we've had many opportunities to have to create tools that support individuals who may be victims of this, including a toolbox, which is located on our ACS website. We've had many educational sessions. We've had experiences where others have been able to share their own experiences, and we have all learned a lot about the signs and the symptoms and the characteristics that define this terrible, terrible condition that plagues all parts of our society. So today we're going to talk about that some. And we're going to try to help you as a surgeon or a surgical resident, a student, whatever you happen to be, 
to recognize, first of all, to be have a heightened awareness uh, and knowledge about intimate partner violence as a common, common condition. Again, yes, with that full spectrum of experience, uh, but also to help prepare you better in how you might recognize intimate partner violence and how you might have the tools to speak to patients or to speak to each other, to your colleagues or friends or family members who you may believe and may in fact be suffering from intimate partner violence, either as a victim or as a perpetrator. So we're going to try to give you some tools today in this session and hope that you'll learn something. We hope that you'll feel empowered to act in a way that maybe you didn't before. And we uh, welcome your participation. And I am really thrilled to have our individuals with us today who have real expertise from both practice and scholarly work in the field. So why don't we start first with you, Dr. Ross. I wonder if you could just maybe first, what we, should, what we should be looking for. What are the what are the signs that we might say? You're a person who takes primarily care of women, right? I mean, all the time. I presume you take care of women as your patients. And this is a, this is a condition that largely affects women, but men and LGBTQ, transgender, everyone can potentially be a victim of this. But as someone who cares primarily for women, the largest cohort at risk for this condition, what can you tell us are the, the signs that we, or the symptoms, the findings that you might notice when you're dealing with a patient that might raise your concerns? So some of the things that I'm immediately looking for, kind of history of anxiety, depression, PTSD in the medical history. And then as I'm kind of gathering their history, I'll build on that to try to understand what are some of the ideologies of these kind of underlying mental health conditions, but then also kind of getting an idea, are they talking about altercations with their partner? Are they expressing that there are outbursts or physical aggression? And we'll get more to the symptoms in a minute kind of describing kind of partner control? Are they kind of constantly looking at the clock, constantly checking their phone for messages? So some of this, some of those signs are somewhat subtle, but especially kind of looking for humiliation, insults from their partner, and kind of histories of altercations and not having control of their time or space or ability to talk in the exam room. Are there any specific quote, screening questions that you routinely use in your practice? So our intake forms, I think you can kind of have discussions as to whether intake forms are the best time or place to ask, but we do have just a general trauma screening question there. And then I'll use that as a jumping off point and say, you know, a lot of people as they're coming in to meet me as a gynecologist or having surgery, we'll find that there's a lot of triggers and re-traumatizing experiences throughout this. So I would just love to take this moment to talk and see how you're doing from these experiences that you've had. And then that can kind of open up the discussion of, you know, this was something that happened in the past. I've been in therapy for 10 years. Things are good now. Thank you for sharing. Or sometimes that's an opportunity to jump in and kind of talk about kind of ongoing episodes of violence and abuse. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll come back a little bit more to what is that discussion like once you kind of think you have a thread going there that really does, uh, you know, a patient has started to open up with you. So let's, or, or a colleague as well. How about you, Dr. Shriver? I know you've written a lot about patterns, I mean, almost pathognomonic patterns of injury and other signs. Can you talk to us about what those... What, what I think a lot of what Dr. Ross said in terms of uh, is the patient, patient speaking for themselves or is there someone else in the room speaking for the patient and looking at the injury patterns? As an ophthalmologist, I'm not often the first person in the emergency room talking to patients. In our emergency room, we have a screening tool uh, that is used and usually it's asked that the patient be alone. When it came to clinic, we decided it wasn't really practical for us to screen every single patient. So we thought we really needed to look into injury patterns. We're good at injury patterns with child abuse. We know what to look for in kids, but we haven't really had good documentation and good guidelines for adults and intimate partner violence, um, patients with intimate partner violence. So what we found is head and neck is most commonly involved. It's between 88, 94% of the injuries involve the head and neck. Um, when you're looking at emergency room visits with these patients, soft tissue injuries are over half the time. And then the maxillofacial facial injuries as well are up around 50%. Typically, if you're looking at injury patterns, you're going to look at patterns in the head and neck region. Uh, the eyes are involved 45% of the time. And that's what really caught my attention is I hadn't talked about IPV at all in my residency training in years of practice. And I realized I wasn't really well prepared for it considering the number of injuries with the eyes. It's the third leading cause of orbital fracture in women and the fourth leading cause of uh, ocular trauma, such as a ruptured globe in women um, of all ages, um, over the adult women over the age of 18. So I think when we're looking 
looking at injury patterns. Also with radiology, we can use some of the tools with radiology looking at fractures and most commonly facial fractures um, are what we're looking for. Um, they found actually with COVID that although rates of calls went down in, in the initial early part of COVID, the severity of the orbital injuries and eye injuries and uh, facial injuries actually went up when you're looking at the radiology of those and is more commonly larger fractures, the zygomatic maxillary complex fractures rather than a small floor fracture. And it's more commonly something like a ruptured globe or a scleral raspiration rather than a small abrasion. So that's really helped us hone in on, um, now we're screening, we have uh, women who are come in with orbital any kind of orbital fracture or a ruptured globe. We make sure to get them in the room by themselves and, and talk with them and screen them as a conversation rather than a screening tool. And we all talk about that later, I'm sure. Are there certain, certain periods of time of life that we are most worried about? Dr. Uh, Ross, do you have this? I, I, um, and I think we heard from Dr. Schreiber, she didn't learn about much about intimate partner violence in residency. And I gotta say, we've only recently begun to introduce this into the core curriculum for our uh, medical students uh, in training and certainly for our different surgical disciplines. Uh, general, uh, well, maybe Dr. Williams can provide some input as to how we've incorporated this into our training for our general surgery residents and for our trauma critical care uh, trainees as well. But, and I, I wonder in obstetrics and gynecology, uh, gynecology training is how is this incorporated into the curriculum? And what would you say is the general fund of knowledge of providers in your discipline on this subject? So one of the areas that we talk about it a lot is during pregnancy, kind of first intake visit and postpartum, because that's kind of an area where families are under a lot of stress and there's a, a spike in terms of an intimate partner violence. A lot of times during this time, it'll be the violence tends to be more focused at the abdomen and breasts. So that is kind of an area where we're very routinely screening. A lot of times we'll actually screen at every visit, which gets kind of redundant for our patients, but it's kind of checking in and saying, hey, are you okay? We know this is a high-risk time in your life. And also just being very careful with any presentation to the Women's Assessment Center, any type of abdominal trauma, falls, unexplained falls, especially focusing on the abdomen. That's kind of a time where we're really, really kind of deeply screening and making sure that patients are safe and that the mechanism of trauma is actually what we expect it to be. Let's switch a little bit to you, Dr. Williams, and talk about, you know, in your role as a leader in trauma and critical trauma surgery in particular, and, and that interface, particularly with public health. Uh, can you sort of speak to us about, number one, kind of your, your the general approach of the trauma community to recognition and then to subsequent intervention strategies and also perhaps partnerships with our public health systems in terms of how we respond to and as provide assistance more broadly to our... Uh... When we look at hospital-based violence intervention program, okay, and how do we not uh, monopolize those resources just around gunshot, but how do we really begin to think about the broader themes that may be uh, occurring in society IPV certainly is one of those things, particularly in a time of a pandemic, where we've had a lot of concurrent issues happening to kind of create a perfect storm for this issue to proliferate in our society. So what are those issues? The trauma surgeon has to be aware that women have been secluded in households where they had no reason to be outside those households, not for leisure, sometimes not for work. And so there were more opportunities for assault, abuse, this issue to proliferate inside of those homes. And, 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 and then you had concomitant increase in consumption of alcohol. And, and the last one, which is really the most egregious issue was consumption of more firearms. Uh, because we know that a young lady, particularly, who's a victim of intimate partner violence, that's really a sign of that person perhaps dying at the hands of that partner at some later date. And so recognizing this issue in trauma becomes a real life or death issue in terms of an opportunity to intervene and save a person's life. That's the real issue on, in, in, in my profession, is that if I can get the victim help, if I can intervene, then it's a good chance that I may save that person's life. And I must understand before any of this, well, what are the possible challenges to intervention? One is financial dependence upon the abuse. The other one is her acting actively as a shield for minors or children, right? 
And if you understand those challenges going into it, you can begin to craft and navigate better strategies about that. What I really do think as surgeons we have to do in the broader scheme is one, understand that if we're in a position to train other surgeons, that we are molding really the next group of surgeons who are gonna be dealing with this issue. So this morning when I came to morning report early, and I just kind of sat in the back as I will often do and look at how the report is being done and just listen. It was interesting because you have to be a little bit vulnerable on these issues if we're really going to be able to, to get the learning and to understand each other. Well, there was a young lady who had been assaulted. And during that assault, which is a, which I always have to disentangle when I hear that word assault, right? Because it becomes this big overarching um, term that includes a lot of different things. But when I hear, what I heard was that the gentleman tried to remove this young lady's clothes and my senior attending asked the resident, was this a sexual assault? And then there was silence in the room with a lot of people. And, and, and there was a hesitance to go beyond the term assault to define this as sexual assault which of course led to an eight minute lecture by me sitting in the back of the room that said, okay, let's talk about the definition of sexual harassment. Let's talk about what sexual assault is. Let's talk about what rape is. Let's talk about what sexual abuse is so that we all know the definitions. And when someone asks you, does this type of behavior falls into sexual assault? Everybody in this room feels comfortable in saying yes. And then being able to position this patient for better services than she might receive if we just called it a regular assault. So I think as surgeons, we have a role in really developing the next group of leaders on this issue. It does take magnification of the curriculum. It does take extending the normal activities of teaching some time to get the points across. I think it's worth it. And then we have the opportunities to advocate for it on a larger level in terms of hospital-based violence intervention programs, public policy, and et cetera. Let's talk a little bit about, so we've talked a little bit about sort of our societal, societal role as surgeons and trying to recognize, elevate, you know, amplify the, this magnitude problem and change policy to address it and very clearly. What about just our own personal engagement with colleagues that we think may be suffering or friends or family members. Is there a uh, sort of a language that we can use? Are there any particular structured conversations that might make that easier for us? I know we all kind of step back and say, oh, you know, I don't want to be wrong about it. I don't want to ask a question that sort of suggests there's some stigmatized condition going on. But the fact is that we need to ask. And we need to be empowered to ask and we need to feel comfortable in asking. And one of the tools of asking difficult conversations is sometimes a structured, a structured set of questions to ask that, you know, or that everybody can share that same language. Does anybody, can, can anybody sort of talk to us a little bit about that? Maybe the safe algorithms or other algorithms that can just help launch that discussion, uh, even with someone that might get mad if you, if you ask, but you got to ask. So I think with, in general, I try to just like launch difficult conversations just with, hey, it's it seems like things are tough. Are you okay? And just like start the conversation with an open-ended question saying, hey, it just like seems like things, I've perceived that things are really tense or looks like you have a lot of bruises and just see kind of where that goes. And then that you can kind of naturally weave into just conversation, the safe algorithm where we're kind of assessing with the S, are they safe at home? Are their kids safe? Are they afraid of their partner? Do their family and friends know of the situation going on? And then they have an emergency plan. And then sometimes it's an awkward conversation, but most people appreciate being asked, are you okay? And even if they answer yes, maybe it'll just be somebody that I'll put a reminder in my phone just to check in in a few weeks say, hey, thinking about you, how have things been? How are the kids doing? So if you can kind of weave it into as natural of a conversation while you're using that infrastructure in the background to see if they're safe. And then if they ever disclose, I think after kind of assessing safety, I'll talk about emergency plan. Like, what are they going to do? And talk about things like making sure that they have a place to go that the perpetrator doesn't know about, 
turn off their phone, make sure that the geolocation is turned off so they can't follow, make sure that they understand that kind of their chance of harm or death is the hardest, the highest risk in the 24 hours after leaving. So kind of focusing on concern and empathy, but also safety and having an emergency plan. For me, often when I see patients, they're not al alone. So they're in an exam room with me, uh, with a partner, or often because they have an eye injury, they have somebody there that helps them with their vision um, or, or their driver or something like that. So uh, for me, initially, the sticky part was trying to figure out how do I get them alone and how do I do that in a way that it doesn't put up the antennae of the, the person that's with them because uh, sometimes it's the, the partner themselves. So I actually practiced and we did a little role playing the residents and myself when I first started doing this and I feel much more comfortable now than I used to and I just say there's part of the exam that I need to do down the hall. I have I prearrange for a room to be available and I take the patient into the room and I tell them you know, this is uh, that I ask all the, the female patients that I have that I have had orbital fractures that I ask them the same questions. And, and so we have a language that we've built. It turns out that actually a structured language and being very forthcoming actually is perceived better by the patients. So we say because um, there's an intimate partner violence is so common, it's the third leading cause of orbital fractures. We ask all these patients this question, have you been physically, sexually, or emotionally abused? And um, do you feel safe? So actually just coming right out, it, it's awkward the first couple of times you do it, but I've gotten more comfortable with it. Statistic that really surprised me was that only 8% of patients are uncomfortable talking about intimate partner violence. But, but I think this the opposite for physicians, probably about 92% of us are nervous about it and only a few are comfortable. So I think that that's helped me a lot practicing coming up with some language, but also I, before you even have that discussion, if you're in a state with mandatory reporting, you need to dis disclose that. So I will tell them that in my state of Iowa, um, I am not a mandatory reporter, so we can have a conversation and I don't have to report it um, unless there's a child involved I mean, or, or life-threatening injury. Um, so I think the biggest thing is not feeling pressure on yourself to get an a a, the perfect answer, to get the right answer. It's more, as Dr. Ross was saying, opening that conversation, being available. Sometimes you're the fourth, fifth, sixth person and they're not ready to talk about it. By the eighth person that asks, the eight opportunity you give them, they are. And then the other thing is not trying to pressure them to leave the relationship. Be there, be understanding, help them come up with an exit plan, but pressuring them or suggesting that they leave the relationship could be the most dangerous, you know, period of time for them. And really just getting them the resources uh, with the local resources that are best for them. Um, you don't have to be the expert at it. You just have to be able to get them hooked up with the right people that, um, that can help them. There are resources in our community that are, and often most hospitals will ha also have um, a, a pattern of referral that includes our social workers or other aspects of the public health sector or hospital-based sector. And we we should all know what they are in our own institutions. That's a that's a bit of homework for everyone is go home and find out who do you call and who do you refer to when uh, when this is the case because they are often obviously our job is to identify not to not to fix the problem or intervene it's to identify and refer and and provide that entry point so that people can achieve the help they need. What I one of the items I've learned about this condition is that actually the cycle is often a four to six year cycle. It sort of takes about that long for a victim to recognize the mess they're in, to be able to separate for all those many reasons you just articulated, uh, Dr. Shriver, and, and then to successfully come out on the other side. The other thing that's, uh, that I've learned about this condition is that um, particularly in those cases that result in death of the victim, is that it's often a double victim. Roughly 60% of the perpetrators of lethal intimate partner violence will kill themselves by suicide as well. So it's a double victim kind of event. It just demonstrates the complexity and severity of this condition. It's not just bad people, although there's some bad people, but but it's a condition. It's a complex condition that uh, really requires professional engagement to help the victim and the perpetrator separate and repair. You know, this is not just a, an at-home phenomenon. You know, sometimes this spills over into the workplace and jeopardizing people in our environment, in the workplace environment and other places. I wonder if we, if anyone else has that experience and, and what are the, what are our options in terms of policy for um, getting this kind of uh, intervention or regulatory uh, work in front of us to recognize IPV as a as a form of workplace violence? Dr. Williams, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, it, it's a complex issue that we have been struggling with in the United States military for decades. And just imagine as a family member, what it would feel like if you got a call from your government saying that your loved one in uniform didn't die 
from enemy fire. They didn't die from a horrific accident from moving large vehicles or equipment, but they actually died at the hands of another soldier engaged in some form of intimate partner violence or sexual assault. We, we have that problem. And the data says clearly with every report that we have that problem. Problem in 2017, sexual report, sexual assault reporting was up 10 percent in the United States military. In 2020 to 2021, it was up 13 percent. And so, some would say that the problem that we have may not be getting better. If you're in the army, well, that's 25.6 percent. If you're in the navy, it's 9.3 percent. If you're in the air force, it's 2 percent. These are supposedly disciplined troops who have a treatment for this that they have to mandatorily go through. And yet these are the numbers that we see. Fort Hood had more deaths than Afghanistan in one year. 13 commanders were relieved of their command because of climate and culture issues. And so what we have done in the military is to put forth the SHARP program. By no means should it be considered um, perfect. It's just a way in which we're trying to manage a very complex problem with young younger individual. Dean Bass asked about is there a specific age group? It caught my ear immediately because I in the military we see it throughout all age groups, right? Particularly on the younger side of the uh, coin. Sexual harassment and response program is the is the name of the short program. And it provides a very interesting framework for victims to report. Reporting has been talked about by Dr. Shriver. You can report in a restricted manner or you can report in an unrestricted manner. So if you want to be confidential with your report, the system allows for you to do that. If you want, if you want, if you don't want that anonymity, the system allows for you to do that. Everybody gets treatment. Everybody gets help. Everybody has a advocate that is assigned to them. We call that person a victim's advocate. The naming maybe not be perfect. We may have to deal with that a little bit. Everybody has a coordinator that is really autonomous outside of the command. Think about this. This person operates outside of the command structure. In other words, the army has thrown up its arms and said, our command structure is totally insufficient to deal with this problem unless we give extra powers to this specific problem that have to be outside of the command structure. And yet we're still suffering with the, pro with the problem. Pro uh, uh, reporting is up and we have soldiers losing their lives to other soldiers because of this. And yet when I look at this program and compare it to government in what we would call CONUS, continental US or other corporate programs, this is a much more thorough program, much more well invested in by you, the American taxpayer than these programs. So I can only imagine what is really going on inside of our private corporate spaces and public spaces on the American side that's not mandatorily training their employees, that's not mandatorily surveying women and other individuals in the environment, which all happens in the military. I have a couple of other questions here on the list, which are really great. Well, I want to give a shout out to Dr. Hannah Decker, who is a uh, fourth year resident uh, in general surgery at UCSF, who together with a team of her residents has led a QI program to increase screening for intimate partner violence in admitted trauma patients. And they now with this education campaign, increased screening rates to 20%. And they're, they're wondering why they haven't gotten farther than that. And they're also feeling a bit frustrated by uh, the fact that they don't really know whether the screening is helping people get out of this vicious cycle. And the question is, how do you address this with your patients and colleagues when you're trying to encourage screening, i.e. what is the next step after screening? And first, I want to give you a I want to give you kudos for doing this, Dr. Decker, and I have no doubt that by with this screening program, you have impacted the lives of many people already. The fact that you may not see that clearly is uh, just, the, you know, just don't, don't worry about that. I would say, don't worry about that. You have impacted the lives of those people that you by bringing this, this topic forward. Um, but I guess that brings me to the, the other, sort of the secondary question of this is, and it's kind of, we're at the front end. Yes, we can find it, but what do we do then? Because we can't, we are not, as physicians and as a healthcare provider, the people that are going to help individuals actually deal with this realized situation that they're in. So what do we do? What are our resources in our community, of which there are many, by the way, that we can uh, refer our patients to? Anything under the self-help groups, the, the uh, other kinds of organizations? Anybody speak to that? 
for us to answer, Dr. Decker? The first thing that's so important is that we're not going to be the end of the line for the therapy and the treatment, right? And so the safe haven resources that exist within our community are designed to provide safe spaces for the victims of intimate partner violence to kind of reconfigure their lives, to kind of understand what situation they're in and make some choices that may eventually lead to them not being in a proximity to, to the abuser or in a, in, a, in a more healthier situation as it relates to the individual uh, they're with. Even in places where the safe haven slots are few and far between, and there are those places in America, particularly when we talk about rural America, and sometimes when we talk about urban America, where this problem is maybe a little bit increased, we have uh, cellular phone apps that offer support to these victims. And the nice things I like about the newer apps is that if someone grabs the phone from the victim to see what they're looking at, the apps are configured in such a way where the app will go away and turn to something very innocuous that they may have been looking at, like a newspaper. That's very ingenious. I like that. And so we have cell phone apps, uh, at least six that I know about, that we can offer as, as support directly to victims. We have safe haven um, spots. Uh, that we can um, we can refer victims to, but again, again, if there are children at home, the safe haven spot is going to be not utilized at a very high percent. I think the hospital violence inter uh, intervention programs also interject the ability for counseling that may be ongoing, even though you can't get them into a safe haven. It provides constant connection with the victim until they can reconfigure safe spots for the children. Because if, if, you, if you're only providing a safe haven for the mom and not the children, it, it just, it's not the full answer. And so, yes, those are the resources that I'm most likely to u utilize here in my trauma. The reason I, I, I think that this is really um, interesting and important is we did this with ophthalmology. We came up with the educational curriculum. We worked with the emergency department, we worked with our residents. Um, and we found uh, a significant increase in homegoing safety assessment, uh, law enforcement involvement, and um, involvement of ancillary services. But we had to do a couple things to do that. We had to make a hard stop in EPIC in the ED. So they had to answer the IPV screening question before they were allowed to move to the next screen. So our team, our uh, nursing team in the emergency room implemented that. We also had to make sure that um, everybody knew how to make chart, uh, the clinic no private. So it wasn't accessible on my chart. So nobody else would be allowed to use it if, because often the partners would start the my chart account, you know, and be able to get into their home, access their clinical records. So we had to do that as well. Anytime that a patient was referred from the emergency department, if there was not in a discussion about who the the perpetrator of the etiology, I'd call the emergency department physician and say, hey, I'm seeing an oral fracture patient. Doesn't look like this was documented. Maybe they had the conversation, homegoing safety assessment, but trying to create that culture, continually work on making sure that we had that discussion. So we aired our dirty laundry. We printed our, you know, our first paper was talking about how little we knew about these injuries and perpetrators. And then our second paper was the improvement we've made and the work we still have to do. So I think that's been helpful. What I found is I used to work with the social worker in the hospital and the domestic violence crisis center at our in our local community is so good that the social worker just told me go through them. So there's the national domestic violence hotline 1-800-799-SAFE. Um, but then uh, otherwise, it's I just have the patient stay in the room. We call the local center, and the patient gets to stay as long as they want talking if they are ready to have that discussion. No, our time's just about up. I have just two things I want to uh, come. I want to bring up from the the discussion on the chat. There's one about abuse of male partners and how common is that? And I will just handle that one pretty quickly and say that it does happen. Women, men on women, women on women, men on men. It's uh, This is a, a phenomenon that needs, knows no specific sexual or gender boundaries. Uh, it is most commonly men on women, but that's just the nature of the beast, but it can happen in all groups, and we need to be aware of that uh, possibility. The other, I think, is really interesting. There's several questions in here about kind of the cultural acceptance of, is there a culture, that, you know, there, there are some places where, where there's some 
in instances in which one may feel that this is a normal human interaction to have these imbalanced relationships with ulti which ultimately can escalate you know from control and up to violence and death and the questions were like how do you deal with how do we change that how do we make it clear to the victims uh, i would say in this particular setting that there is no cultural culturally valid measure that allows these kind of abusive relationships. You may not feel that way when you're in the middle of them, and there may be some cultures that have not reached this uh, recognition point that we believe is so important here in this country. I I'd love the thoughts on others about how do we change this, and you know, and in many respects, this is kind of removing the stigmatization. This condition um, still carries, like somehow it's the victim's fault, right? How do we change that? messaging what's how do we bring this into the air as really as a culture start to a society start to deal with this the philosophers say that artists sit at the vanguard of the society and i and i truly believe that that's true so much of how we change culturally is can be found in our art and our entertainment and i think a lot of what we're seeing in society through our entertainment and our art is suggesting that that's not okay even when you listen to the lyrics of more popular music with our with our young people that's a complex question the more complex question is why is it that if i were to do a literature well not a literature search but a chart review about these issues 30 years ago i would not find anything documented in an ed chart about domestic violence or intimate partner violence, and these were educated individuals who went to medical school. What was what was going on with that culture? And I think that the while I'm so excited about this committee is because this committee is really going to deal with us, right? There's a lot of things going on out there we're not going to get the answers to, but we're going to start looking internally at us and finding out why residents won't say sexual assault or, or, or those types of things. What, what, what's going on up here and how we're educated? And I think that provides opportunities because we're educating diverse individuals. And so if they're getting educated appropriately by us, they are leaders in their communities and they go on to have a, a, a exponential impact. You know, we have talked about resources for victims. There are also groups out there for perpetrators of violence. They're often organized police departments. They're often organized by men's groups in the community. Uh, they're often faith-based organizations, but there is help out there for those groups. And I think that, again, getting someone to recognize that the pattern of behavior is not okay is the first step. The second step is to make sure there's a, a net a net for that person to fall into to get the help that they need, uh, because this is often a two-victim kind of, but again, it's it's one of those things that your public, your department of uh, public health or your health department will actually be aware of these resources. Social networks will be aware of these uh, resources, and I encourage everyone to to use those because, and, and remember, this is not a one and done. This is a many years worth of care kind of work that comes to uh, get individuals out of these uh, harmful, harmful relationships. I, I want to close with one little anecdote. Much to your point, Dr. Williams, um, one of my faculty members, who's a senior physician in one of the institutions where I've worked, and one of, and her first uh, relationship was involved in a harmful intimate partner violence relationship, which she shares openly and talks about. She recalls one time almost some 40-something years ago when she went to the emergency room with a orbital injury, and the response from the emergency room doc was, oh, you didn't duck, you didn't duck fast enough, huh? That was really the telling that, you know, she'd been abused by her partner. Um, that was the response. Well, you didn't duck fast. So, I mean, that just sort of shows where we, we still have work to do. I don't care if that was 40 years ago or 10 years ago. There is still, this still is a condition that people are often afraid to bring forward. They're, they're often afraid to discuss openly. This is, this is us though. I mean, this is all of us here. And if we, you know, even as we think about our patients, we also have to be mindful that in our community of surgeons, of gynecologists, of, you know, of all the groups that are represented here today, there are those among us who have, uh, who are victims and who are like, who are perpetrators as well. And we need to kind of look for ways in our community to destigmatize this, to reach out, to help each other. I always call it looking for that disturbance in the force. And I don't, you know, we know our colleagues well. And, and we, when we some, see something is not right, that repeated phone calls, that whispering into the phone, that just, they just got to ask. And I, I've often said, if I knew now what I knew then, you know, things might be different. And so let's all get educated about this condition. 
let's all you know be mindful of our be our brothers and sisters keepers and let's see if we can at least be part of the solution in helping those who find themselves in these unfortunate relationships but thank you very much for your participation everyone i really value your uh, insights and sharing it today and thank you very much and i wish you all a great afternoon